Welcome to Commonwealth Politics. I'm George Serra. And I'm Mike Krasanek. Our focus today is the U.S. Senate special election here in Massachusetts and its implications. And with us to talk about this topic, we have the Republican State Party Chairwoman, Jennifer Nazor, and the Democratic State Party Chairman, John Walsh. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Our pleasure. I'd, I'd like to uh, begin by uh, uh, stating, I think the obvious is that the uh, election of uh, Scott Brown uh, shook up the political establishment here in, in Massachusetts. Uh, Senator uh, Ted Kennedy, the late senator, held that seat since 1962. And uh, Scott Brown, who was a relatively unknown state senator, uh, came out of nowhere in, in the minds of many people and uh, defeated Martha Coakley, the uh, uh, state's attorney, attorney general. Uh, as a result of that, I think it's probably fair to ask both of our, our guests here to put this into some kind of uh, context here and, and give us some idea of uh, why this uh, shakeup has occurred, uh, why uh, Scott Brown uh, was victorious, and, and what this might mean uh, down the line for future elections uh, here in Massachusetts at the gubernatorial and other state, statewide elections. So, John, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. What does this all mean? And, uh, What's going to happen down the line, perhaps, as a result of this election of well, Senator Brown? Well, they say the history is written by the victor, so I'd be happy to allow Jed if she'd like to start off. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that the, the political climate was ripe for um, a change that we heard so much about in 2008. And so what had happened was um, at, when the seat was left vacant by the uh, untimely death of Senator Kennedy and, um, and Scott Brown had decided that he was going to run, there was a four-way Democrat primary and a two-way Republican primary. Scott Brown emerged with 85 percent of that, which in really energized our base, got people going, got them ticking, got them thinking, this is actually a possibility. Martha Coakley, on that very same night that Brown's campaign kind of ramped up because of all the excitement, Coakley acted as if it was a coronation and that we, she was being handed the, um, the senator's position and she didn't have to do anything else. So while Scott Brown was over at, Fen at Fenway Park shaking hands of people in the cold, she was saying, why do I need to shake hands with people in the cold? When Scott Brown had Rudy Giuliani up here and he had um, Kurt Schilling, who was supporting him, Martha Coakley made a statement that, that Schilling was just another Yankees fan. Um, while Scott Brown knew that there were still terrorists in Afghanistan, um, Martha Coakley asked, you know, said that there weren't any terrorists in Afghanistan. So I think that there were a series of um, lapses in her campaign that, um, and, and with Scott Brown, it was played flawlessly. And so between our assistance, what we were able to do, along with the national folks, and the, um, the fact that we had over two million people that were contacted, voter contacts, we um, had expenditures, coordinated expenditures of nearly a million dollars. We, um, we had organized groups and groups of people. We had 23 states that sent volunteers to Massachusetts. 50 states participated in our phone from home program. It was definitely an enormous effort. A lot of energy went into it, and that's how we ended up being victorious. And is that the way you see it, John? Well, I think that uh, unquestionably, and congratulations to Scott Brown, uh, who ran an excellent campaign, and I and I uh, share Jen's uh, analysis of the of the skill with which his team ran the election. I think that um, uh, Jen is also right in talking about the climate and the atmosphere uh, that uh, that the election was won in. Um, I I would probably not surprisingly dispute a little bit the uh, uh, disparaging Martha Coakley or her effort in the campaign. I think uh, one of the things that we, that all of us, although I disagree with the majority of voters at, on uh, January 19th, we all celebrate the fact that on a cold, rainy, snowy in some parts of the state day, 2.2 million people decided that our political system was worth their time and energy, that actually their vote mattered and that their participation in politics was a worthy way to, um, to uh, express their concerns. The atmosphere, um, you know, from, a, uh, uh, from a, an analysis, there's been so much written and analyzed. My, my favorite part of, of the analysis is, uh, as we are now explained and told exactly what the election meant by the pundits and wise guys, 
uh, these are the same people three weeks before the election who said there's no way there's going to be a Senator Scott Brown. And that shouldn't be surprising to us, honestly. They said there would not be a Governor Deval Patrick or mm -hmm. President Barack Obama. One of the lessons I take from that election is that we all need to be conscious at every election that the conventional wisdom does not decide elections, mm -hmm. but in fact voters do. And the voters are anxious to have a conversation about the, the, the political system and the climate and the issues that are important to them. And what's really important and that we're going to take uh, out of this is that work on the ground can affect that decision. And, and I, again, I, I, uh, I congratulate uh, uh, Senator Brown on a, on, a, on a solid campaign. I, am, I was encouraged with his vote to support the President's Jobs Bill. I know that he got a lot of aggravation from some of the, uh, as Jen mentioned, it was, a, it was a remarkable and interesting time for Massachusetts uh, political people. In most elections that have a broader national implication, both Democrats and Republicans from Massachusetts, we're net exporters. We're, elite, we're heading to other states. Uh, in this election, we both, both sides experienced the, uh, the rest of the nation arriving here in, in droves uh, to play an influence. Um, I do think, honestly, that, there were, that, there, that uh, on the Republican side or, the, or the, you know, the movement that's known as the Tea Party movement to, uh, that's angry with what's happening in government played an important role. And, they, and uh, it, I think it was an interesting time for uh, people in Massachusetts. Some of the national uh, Theatrics that we generally watch from our couch uh, played around on town squares, and uh, but I think that the uh, the second part of your question, which is the implications going forward, I think, and, and this is good for democracy, that both sides are energized and ready to have a conversation about the direction we go forward. I'd just like to pick up on on two points you made, which I, I agree with you. Uh, the um, work on the ground. Uh, and I assume you, you reference that reference was to local grassroots mm -hmm. uh, movement, uh, and the second, the uh, notion of angry with government, and the scholarship in this area that that is written by political scientists indicate that in fact dissatisfaction, that anger on the ground, is a huge motivator in elections, which is part of the reason we saw such a a large turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, if you both maybe just briefly talk about from your perspective, the um, local um, grassroots um, orientation moving forward into the uh, November elections. And um, this notion of, of anger and dissatisfaction, how do you see that playing out uh, in November? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Such a gentleman. <laughs> Um, well, I, 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 I absolutely agree with what John had said about the implications and about how it really energized both parties, and we, we needed it. I think that each of us had our, had our own issues, and people just kind of get complacent. Whether you're winning or losing, you get complacent, and so it was a good thing. Um, and there is so much anger out there, because I think what happened was people sat at home a lot, and people didn't pay attention a lot. And now everyone woke up. Voters woke up and said, wow. Things are not going on the path I want them to go on. And so now I'm going to take activism into my own hands. And I'm going to get out there and I'm going to either work at a phone bank or I'm going to talk to friends or I'm going to pay attention to what those politicians are saying. Not only what they're saying, but what have they been doing? And are they voting? Are the incumbents voting the way that they're talking about at home? Or are they doing, are they saying something here, doing something else here? And people are really awakened now, which I think is a fantastic opportunity for um, politicians new and old to go and speak to those voters. But people are definitely awake right now. It's true. And, and uh, um, I also decry the complacency, although the complacency where we were complacent winning and you were complacent losing was a little more comfortable for me, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, not, it's not good for either of us, Sorry. I totally understand. Um, and I think that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, the grassroots community organizing base of politics is basically w what I come from. Uh, that's what I did. I'm very proud to have been Deval Patrick's uh, campaign manager. You could say there were a lot of similarities in, in how no both question. of them ran their campaigns. And not only the way the campaigns were run with a grassroots focus, but honestly, the way their campaigns benefited from that. And honest, and, and part of what you're saying about the, the uh, I'm not sure I'd call it anger, but the, uh, the discomfort, the, the agitation on the ground, 
Uh, it, to me, it translates as an impatience. And, and we have been voting for change around here for a long time. And I think people are continuing to express an impatience with the pace of that change. Um, and, and I think that's something that every elected official, every party person, every party leader uh, is wise to be conscious of. Um, it, is, it is really important, uh, and the only way to do that is face-to-face. -face. There's all kinds of, uh, of uh, anecdotal evidence that, and, and statistical evidence that the way we've been running campaigns on both parties, uh, and, and the way, honestly, that most campaigns still are run, are based on tactics that are not working anymore, whether it's telephone calls or direct mail or TV ads, the evidence is clear that they're diminishing in effectiveness, and that's another thing that we have to really work for. I believe, and I believe Governor Patrick was right the day after the election when he uh, theorized that the, the energy around change that brought him to office and brought Barack Obama to office in a different version, but the same idea is what uh, played out on January 19th. And I think that uh, as we go into these uh, fall elections, it's really important because the, uh, a big question is, has the change been delivered? Are we moving towards a change? Um, and I would make a case that, that in fact it has in some very significant ways. And the question that's before the voters in November is, do we continue moving in that progress of change? Um, uh, Jet, one of Jen's candidates' uh, basic theory of the gubernatorial race is we're going to go back to the good old days. And, uh, and I'm not sure that's the sense of what the voters are looking for right now, uh, but that sort of theory, that kind of grassroots energy, that face-to-face -face voter contact, we're going to have a lot of conversations in the next eight months about what that means. And can I just also so add in? Do you in, want to go back to the good old days? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am very forward thinking. I, and, and I would like to, to also say that I don't think I have that many old days behind me yet. So, <laughs> so it's all forward. I'll let you guys run it. I think she's calling you old, Mike. I don't know. <laughs> she's probably right. I think she is right. I think the three of us got that. She is right. Um, but what, the one thing I'd like to add is that I do, I do think that there is some anger, though, because we have noticed in the past year our um, our state our committees our town and ward committees we actually were a little under 300 committees that were organized we're now over 400 um, out of 600 so even though we're still not quite there we have organized so many town committees which proves that people are saying you know what I'm done hands up I'm finished and I'm not giving up I'm now taking that action and moving forward so again it's good and, and the conversations are going to be wonderful mm -hmm. I'll ask both of you, Jennifer, I'll start with you, is that uh, Scott Brown clearly won the independent vote, and, and the, the pundits were saying it was because of health care, or it's because of Beacon Hill, or it's because of Obama, or what was it? What, what seems to be, in your view, now that you can reflect on the election, what was driving this anger? What are people most angry about? Is it joblessness now, or, or is it a combination? What seems to be the, uh, the, the kind of issue that you will be telling your candidates in the future to uh, zero in and get that independent vote? Definitely jobs and the economy. Um, that, that is very, very important. I think um, it, it, the election was really, Scott Brown's election, if you look at it, and as political scientists, you can, you can analyze it on this level, too. It was definitely a two-prong election. There was the money part, and then there was the voter part. The money part, a lot of people were had incentive because it was the 41st vote on health care. And so people around the nation woke up, and money, people were excited about contributing money because they were contributing to that factor. I believe that Massachusetts residents voted for Scott Brown not because of the health care vote as much because we have health care in Massachusetts and he made a fantastic um, uh, argument on health care because we have, ma we have health care, um, but because people are so disenchanted with Beacon Hill right now. They are sick of the politics going on. They're sick of the games that are going on. We, everyone wants reforms. They want real reforms. They want those reforms to be made and they want them to be solid. And everyone just kind of tiptoes and says, yes, this is a reform, a uh, you know, bunch of little agencies, one big agency, we don't cut anything, no one loses a job, no spending goes down, spending continues to go up. 
Massachusetts right now. Just this week, we hear that our unemployment numbers are at 9.5%. Nationally, they're at 9.7%. There is absolutely no reason in the world why Massachusetts, with the fantastic colleges and universities that we have here, state schools and private schools, that we should have that type of unemployment rate. And so really, there there is Brown's election was, was definitely a two-prong. Okay. John, uh, what are the Democrats going to run on in November and, and perhaps when they uh, challenge uh, Scott Brown in a couple of years? I mean, is there, are there some issues that uh, they're, they're going to be zeroing in on as, uh, as they mount their campaigns? Uh, no question, and, and there, there's no perhaps in the challenging Scott Brown in a couple of years. Um, but I think that the, the, the point about independent vote is important, and in fact, uh, if you were trying to imagine the phrase that uh, a Republican candidate running for office is least likely to say, is least likely to say, you would think maybe I'm going to raise your taxes, but less likely than that is I'm a Republican. Scott Brown never used the term, I, I, and I've watched as, as the Republican candidates for statewide office have been declaring uh, the word independent is all over uh, their, uh, of their, their language. Uh, but in fact, they're running as Republicans with, with the party's uh, endorsement, hopefully, and I think that that's important. Um, the, I think what happens in, 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 this, uh, in this era of the independent voter is that um, I think of it much less as groups of voters and more as individual voters. But if you give me a, you know, there's this sort of geographic or demographic theory of how elections are won or lost, and it, one of them that's funny is that it's got a map around the 495 area that's independent, and then there's a, a grouping of voters that independents are somehow this sort of mushy middle. Um, well, in fact, in my experience, if you give me a hundred unenrolled voters, there's eight of them that are more conservative than the Republicans and hate. Republicans. There are eight of them that are more liberal than the Democrats and hate the Democrats. There may be 15 or 20 of them in the middle that are purely strategic and they want to play in both sides. And there's a whole chunk of them, honestly, that registered when they got their driver's license and are not participating in the process. <laughs> so I think that what's more important than thinking about people as an unenrolled voter, I mean, Jen and I go into the voting booth and we cast votes that are at least partially motivated to support our party. But we are very much in the minority. Very few voters look at this and say, I'm interested in uh, perpetuating democratic dominance or I'm interested in, uh, in changing and improving the Republican Party status in Massachusetts. Uh, and that's why that over these many years, and uh, with the exception of January 19th, uh, the Democratic Party continues to elect Democratic candidates to office. And, and in, in essence, in, in answer to your question directly, uh, Michael, is that the, um, what the Democrats who are running for office are going to be emphasizing in this election is what we always do, uh, that we have a better candidate who has a better position on the issues relative to their opponent for the voters in the district they represent. And that's why that uh, although we are in a position and have been for maybe a decade where it's almost statistically impossible to increase the number of Democrats in the legislature. Uh, in fact, last year there were 15 open seats, in 2008, 15 open seats in the legislature. When the smoke cleared, all 15 were registered as Democrats, and three of them had been represented by Republicans in Republican-leaning districts the day before. They weren't, the people in those districts in Attleboro and in Hopkinton and Holliston were not deciding, geez, I need a more, another Democrat. They're deciding that, uh, that uh, Bill Bowles in Attleboro or Carolyn Dykema in Hopkinton, Holliston is a better candidate who reflects my position on issues and my hopes and desires for the future than the person who's running against them. And I think that's, that's how we're focusing on these elections, one at a time on the specific interests and, and, uh, and issues that are important to the voters in each one. Historical trends indicate that uh, in every midterm election, and November uh, is a midterm election, the president's party inevitably loses seats. There are only three exceptions in 20th and 21st century, uh, 1934, 1998, and 2002. Given those historical trends in New Jersey, Virginia, Massachusetts, um, how, how do you think Democratic candidates uh, need to position themselves, and, and it is positioning oneself, um, for the November election. Uh, do they invite the president in? Let's say we're talking about the gubernatorial race. Uh, or do they distance themselves from the president? What, what type of strategies would you encourage um, members of your party to embrace? And, and I'll ask the same question of you. 
I did, and and, and uh, uh, I think that uh, historical trends are written after the fact, so we'll, we'll see how this one fits in historical trends. Uh, I think about elections less than that, but as you reflect in them, uh, since it was an exception in 98, it was an exception in 02, I was personally very happy with the results in 06. That's a trend I'll be happy to continue, but I'm not sure that I can rely on that as a uh, as a uh, as a. But as you a did basis. have a Republican president at the time, so well, absolutely, so, that's and, part and of the, and the it cycle. Is, it's more of a national trend than a statewide trend, I think. That uh, and and but to your question about uh, candidates, uh, I will and we will enthusiastically welcome the president to Massachusetts every time he's willing to come, and every time members of his administration are coming to announce more funding from uh, from the from the. Uh, uh, the United States uh, Recovery Act to announce more policy provisions like Massachusetts making finalists for the race to the top money will welcome them every day and, and enthusiastically take their support. I think that candidates who think about elections and not, not, to, not to be fresh about the, your question, but if you think about an election, how you're going to position yourself, you, that's a mistake. You're going to position yourself who you are, I hope. You're going, to, you're going to state what you believe. You're going to fight for what you believe in and talk to voters directly. I think that there's too much of politics that is, that is trying to extrapolate some kind of a statistical uh, a bent in, in, in historic trends or current trends or demographic trends or geographic trends as opposed to get on the front door and talk to the person directly and tell them your story. I think that's how the elections are going to be won now. I think that's what they're that they're that they're won in honestly every time I've ever participated. Definitely. Well, we we agree on that. I mean, talking talking directly to the voters is one of the things that our candidates have been doing. And um, talk about a trend. My goodness, have you seen all the Democrats that have decided that they're not running this year? <laughs> Um, there is a little bit of a trend there, and so whether it's retiring or moving on to do other things, it does it does allow some openings. Um, and yes, there is a trend because people are really um, are really unhappy right now. They they expected a lot um, and were promised a lot from the Obama administration. They were promised a lot from the the Patrick Murray administration. No one has followed through on anything that they had promised. And once you start breaking promises, people start taking it out on the next guy up. And so whoever is up, and it happens to be this year, um, and, and they will go to the polls, and they will take it out on the Patrick Murray administration. They will take it out on the congressional delegation that's staying around. Um, and they will take it out on the legislators that, that are the incumbents that have been there for a while and have voted on sales tax, have voted for Sal DeMacy. That's where it will come in. So definitely, I, I believe in the trend. Um, but it is more than that. It is where, where, where politics has gone now where constituents have been forgotten about. And it just coming up in eight months and saying, hello, how are you? I'm your local state rep or your state senator, isn't enough for people. Where it's where have you been, not what, what are you doing for me lately. Um, and the other thing I, I absolutely agree with, bring the president on. I absolutely. love when he comes to town. <laughs> he went to Virginia and he lost. He went to New Jersey, he lost. He came to Massachusetts, he lost. Come on, and I, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> I'd be happy to help with that, absolutely. Um, um, I think the, the question of vacancies that Jen brings up is interesting because, and, and I, I'm trying to interpret her suggestion that the Democrats are leaving is somehow in reaction to Scott Brown, right? Um, well, uh, first of all, two-thirds of the people who, uh, in, from both parties who have announced they're leaving, which is over 30 now and, may, and going north of that depending on what happens in these races, which is double last time. Um, Two-thirds of the people that they're leaving are actually running for other office. So they're not saying, oh, the voters are too angry, I'm leaving. They're saying, oh, there's an opportunity here with voters engaged, I'm going to present my credentials and seek another office. So I, I don't think that that's really a legit thing. But if I were to concede the point that there's something bad about people running for office, the truth is almost a third of the Republicans in the legislature are leaving. Not quite a third, but since Bob Hedlund decided to stay home, it doesn't get to a third. So if it's bad that people are leaving, a much smaller percentage of the Democrats are leaving than the Republicans. And I totally agree we're going to have an election about promises kept. And it's going to be because we have candidates with records. And the promises that were kept in, in the Patrick Murray administration were based on the promise that we're going to change the way business is done on Beacon Hill. And we can talk about the tax vote, and we can talk about the targeted votes that the Jen's pollster is telling her is going to work. But how about this? For, and for more than 30 years, we've been talking about getting rid of the Mass Turnpike Authority. 
It was a Democratic governor, a Democratic-dominated legislature that did it. We've been talking about putting flaggers on the streets of the Commonwealth. Republican governors for 16 years talked tough on it. But it's a Democratic governor and Democratic legislature that did it. Ethics reform, pension reform, lobbying reform, education reform, transportation reform. I just need to interrupt reform. you for one second because it's important that our viewers get accurate information. It was a Republican governor who proposed getting rid of uh, the the uh, the the uh, absolutely transport and the Democratic Congress, excuse me, legislature that blocked it. No, no. So, but uh, as a matter of fact, I would concede it was more than one Republican governor that proposed it, but it was a Democratic governor that got it through. And and so I think if the voters are interested in the rhetoric of change then they have two people to choose from. But if they're interested in, an, uh, in, a, in, the, in the candidate that actually, de I mean, Deval Patrick didn't think of getting rid of the Turnpike Authority. He didn't think of putting flaggers on the streets. He didn't think of toughening the ethics laws. These are proposals that have been on the table, proposed by administration after administration. I think what the voters want is an administration and a governor, lieutenant governor, they're actually going to deliver on that change. And you don't and think that because you, we had divided government that played any role? I'm just trying to give the well, viewers no, no, a fair approach. Well, I, I appreciate it, and, and I'm sure Jen particularly appreciates it, but here's the point. If there are voters who are interested in casting their vote to determine the level of divided government, then they're probably going to vote for a Republican. And honestly, if that was my biggest issue, I would vote for a Republican. But I don't think that's what voters decide. I think that voters are going to say, are you delivering on the things that are important to me? And through the last three and a half years, the government of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has had a string of deliveries on the promise of change. And we've had, we've had decades of talk and three years of deliveries. And we, okay. I'm go, no, go ahead, because we, 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 we just one, got a couple, a <laughs> couple of minutes here. You get so the I, last word. You get the last Absolutely. word. One quick thing. When the entire government is run by the same party, you would hope that the sitting governor would actually get some things in. And whether it was Romney or Swift or Salucci or Weld, they always backed up against the Democrat legislature. We also need to make sure that there are new people in, that there are new ideas that are going on, and that there is a, a valid conversation and a debate that goes on in government that is not one party that rules. And the reforms last year, if you ask me, it was just a bunch of respinning and throwing it back out and saying that was reform, and, and everyone seemed happy with it. But I, but I like your spin on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And as a matter of fact, the, the new ideas is important. As a matter of fact, since Deval Patrick has become governor, over 25% of the legislature is new. So one of the reasons we're getting this done is in the legislature, there is a raft of new energized legislators who are impatient. And by the way, of those 50 new legislators, only one of them is a Republican. It's good to have four new speakers, too. And that has to be the last <laughs> word. Thank you so much for watching Commonwealth Politics, and thank you to our guests thank for being here. Thank welcome. you so much, thank both you. of you. For more information about this program or the Center for Legislative Studies, contact Dr. George Serra, the coordinator of the Center for Legislative Studies at Bridgewater State College, Bridgewater, Mass., 02325.